Welcome to the Define You Radio Podcast, where class is always in session. Get ready for the life lessons, tips, and stories to help you define your life. And now, your host, the drill sergeant with love, Valencia Griffin Wallace. Thank you much, so much for tuning in to Define You Radio. I'm your host, Valencia Griffin Wallace. Make sure you like, love, share the video, and leave your comments below. We were going to go live on Instagram, but we'll get into that in a moment. So let's go ahead and welcome the hot seat queens, Queen Shannon. Hey, y'all. And Queen Levon. Hi, guys. So we're, we're we're supposed to have a guest tonight. She was having technical difficulties. So tonight is a total, um, we're just going to talk about obstacles tonight. That's why we're just going to be real because we were going to try to do Facebook Live and Instagram Live. Mm-hmm. We're, we were going to try to do X, Y, and Z and Z, Y, and X. And it was just the, you know. But we're going to be great anyway. So we're going to talk about some obstacles that has happened thus far in 2019. Classes and sessions okay. and papers ready. So let's talk about <laughs> obstacles, Queen. Let's just let's just talk. We haven't like this is really OK. Angela has joined. We'll go ahead and let her on. So we're not talking about obstacles tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. We're going to have our guest, <laughs> Angela Ray. Let's go ahead and welcome her to the show. Hey, Miss Angela. Welcome. welcome. Hey, hey how's how everybody going? Good. There we go. Good. Okay, you can see us. I can. Okay. Yes. Good evening, Queen. Good evening. Welcome. Okay, Thank guys. Thank you. Um, we have our guest on, Miss Angela Ray. Make sure you like, love, and share the video. Like I said, and tonight, we're introducing you to Angela. Like I said, it's been a crazy night. But Angela is an actress, author, and speaker. She is a multifaceted performer with credits on hit shows like Atlanta, Queen Sugar, and Love Thy Neighbor. She uses her training as an actress as the foundation for her other career endeavors she is also an author and y'all know we love authors here hey queen Nequisha, make sure you like love and share the video she uh is an author the author of rays of motivation megastar student leadership and blackberry whispers which we will be talking about tonight so go ahead uh queen angela and say hey to the define you radio audience What's up, Define You Radio? Thank you so much for having me on this evening. We're excited. A lot of you guys may remember I interviewed Angela last year at the Atlanta Black Theater Festival happening in October. I expect to see y'all there. Um, and she, she, among her acting and everything she does, I was surprised to find out she was an author. So my first question to kind of go ahead and get us into it. Why Why did you decide to write? So why did I decide to write? I got started writing poetry actually off a of dare. I was in the seventh grade. We were in Mrs. Patterson's seventh grade English class and we were studying poetry. And one of my classmates, I will never forget, Amy Pendergrass asked me if I could write poetry, but I had never written anything. So me, not you know, wanting to admit that I couldn't. I said, yes, I can write poetry. She's like, well, I dare you to write a poem about a crush. And so I took her up on the dare. And that's that's how I started writing poetry. Now, I will say that first poem was not good. It was probably garbage, (laughs) but that kind of ignited something in me. And so I continued to write on my own, never shared any of those early poems with anybody. But by the time I got to college, I was ready to really get some help with writing. And so I took a poetry class, started entering poetry contests, started winning. And then I decided to publish several years later at the encouragement of actress Suzanne Douglas, who told me that I should use my poetry to fuel other things that I was doing in the arts, namely my acting. Mm. Awesome. So you, you started writing before you actually started acting. That is correct. Awesome. I didn't it, know what I was going to do with it at the time. You just did it, which is, you know, that's. I think we all kind of start 
writing like that when you're a true writer you just start writing not knowing exactly where you're going with it and one of the things Angela informed me is that April is hey Queen Ashanti um April is National Poetry Month did y'all know that no I did not know that I did so I'm saying so Queen LaVon I, I know you have questions go ahead well, I am a lover of poetry um yes I love poetry so in your this your new book Blackberry Whispers well I love the title because it makes me think about you you all know the Blackberry phone everyone had one everyone <laughs> loved that phone you know until the little wheel out the middle fell out it had no paint or anything left how on. about that so <laughs> In your process of starting of writing Blackberry Whispers, how were you um, drawn to that name? Did the phone have anything to do with it, or were you just was it just a play on words? So yeah, the phone had nothing to do with it when I came up with the title. So Blackberry Whispers was my first book and I have now updated it. So this is the second edition. So when I wrote the book in 2004, I'd never even heard of the Blackberry phone. And so my thinking with Blackberry Whispers are the sweet prayers that we say through our poetry. And that's where the title came from. Had nothing to do with the phone. It's amazing now many years later that, you know, the Blackberry is such a popular device for people. But yeah. Had nothing to do with the phone at the time. You was a pioneer. That's all. Absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, I mean to be honest, you know, the singer in me, I saw black, and the only thing I could think of the song "Blackberry Molasses." So that's where my mind went, oh. and I immediately started singing. <laughs> I saw it, and I was like, "Oh, Blackberry Molasses." That's what made me. It caught me. So it is a very, very catchy title, though it really is. It takes you, yeah. especially depending on your generation, it can catch them. Either way, um, so that's a very, very awesome title. I can awesome see it being a jazz, a jazz song. It has that yes. feel to it. I could see that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. yes, indeed. So, Queen Angela, uh, look at me, Queen Angela. Well, I said that right, Queen Angela. Mm-hmm. Um, what's one of the biggest obstacles you face when? when writing this book or rewriting it and hey sam we see you thank you for joining us again make sure y'all like love and share the video i think my biggest obstacle was just self-doubt like me getting in my own way because i again i had been writing for a number of years i had At that point, before I published, I'd actually shared a lot of my poetry live. I had been traveling, doing poetry slams, actually winning poetry slams, but still was very hesitant to put pen to paper and commit to this is the final draft and this is what I'm going to hand off into the world. So I think the biggest obstacle for me was my own self-doubt. Do you think, uh, do you see a lot of people, um, because especially because you're an actress, you know, mainly that's where a lot of people will know you from more than being an author, probably, or maybe, you know, a little bit of both. Do you see people getting in their own way because they feel like they should only do one thing? Absolutely. Uh, I can say that, you know, at at times that's been my own thing, because one of the reasons I decided to come back to Blackbeard Whispers is because at one time, poetry was a huge, huge percentage uh, part of of me performing. And so I'd kind of put it aside when I decided to focus on film and television. And so there is a whole community of people who are in my circle who are just finding out in the last year or two that I write and perform poetry because I wasn't doing anything with it for so many years. And so I, I was wondering how I would be viewed, you know, doing poetry, but also acting if people would not take me seriously as an actor, because in some, there are some schools of thought when it comes to acting, that that is what you have to do. You have to be serious. You have to, to train, you have to be laser focused. And so I didn't really want to be perceived as a jack of all trades and a master Mm -hmm. of none, particularly as it became to my acting. However, what I began to realize was that my performing poetry was just a different genre of acting. Right. And that right. kind of gave me permission to explore and share it again in a different way. Hmm. Queen Shannon. So I, I wanted to touch. Um, so first I want to ask the poem that you recited at uh, the Women in Media Entertainment Awards. Is that a poem that's in Blackberry Whispers? 
that is not in Black Beer Whispers. That is actually in Rays of Motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, that is the only poem that's in that book as well. Like that is more, of, I consider that my affirmation poem. And since the majority of Rays and Motivation is affirmations that, you know, individuals can read as a part of their daily meditation, I decided to include that poem in that book. Awesome. And now, so the second part of that, that poem, um, you com- you commanded the stage with that poem. She did. Um, when you, you stepped on Thank and you, you just went into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to know if, if were you always able to command the stage with your poetry in that manner or, or did the acting help you hone in and tweak that commandment of, of, of being in that, that presence? Mm. I would say definitely the acting, the acting as well as the speaking. I was, you know, in between, you know, on stage, I think the first thing that I was doing a lot of was poetry. I transitioned that into doing a lot of speaking, still doing poetry, but the two were not together. And then at some point when I decided I didn't want to do the poetry slams and the open mics, I decided to incorporate the poetry within my speaking. And so the sharper I got in speaking, which was, you know, I think enhanced by my acting, the better my poetry got. So that's why I eventually just realized they're all related. It's just a different genre. Hmm. So when you introduce yourself to people, what do you say? Hi, I'm Angela Ray. I'm an actress, author, and MC. That's most of the time. I rarely, <laughs> I rarely introduce myself as a poet, even though I do poetry. And, but yeah, I rarely. So the author usually takes care of that. I, I kind of, you know, because I, I don't want to be like, "Hi, I'm an actress. I'm an author. I'm a speaker. I'm an." It's too much. But I try to when I mention author, usually. I, I hope people know that, you know, the poetry is encompassed in that. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I only could imagine because even, you know, today, a lot of women, I know the all of us here at Define You Radio, we have different titles. So, and I always say, you know, when you introduce yourself to people, my thing is that I would say the the first thing you say is that one that you kind of want to put the nail in the head in. Mm-hmm. What what are your thoughts, especially because you're maneuvering around Atlanta, you're writing and, you know, you're directing as well. Um, yes. So especially so with all of those things, do you feel like the best way is to your first introduction and your first title, so to speak, is the one you kind of want to put the nail in a coffin in? so to speak. I think that's probably the best way to do it. I think I generally lead with acting because that is the one that I am most visible with that, you know, there are things when I mention some of my credits and I can mention an episode, it automatically becomes real for people with the speaking, with the hosting, with the emceeing, with being a poet and, and even with directing that doesn't always excite people and or people can't always uh, see that as being tangible for them and having a relationship with it or, or being able to to kind of visualize what that means for them and who I am. So generally, I lead with the acting. But I think what you said, Valencia, is right. You know, you, you should lead with the thing that you want to um, to focus on and you want people to remember the most. Hmm. Queen Levon. I have a question, um, Angela, concerning... Um, composing this book it makes me think about um kind of like those sunday saturday evenings or those sunday lazy sunday type conversations of ladies around the table you know when you're just kind of chit-chatting and i think you got that's one of your um subjects you talk about just the chit-chat would you say that your upbringing, you know, being around, maybe watching, you know, your mom and your aunties or watching other women sit and have those conversations that, that influence um, any parts of your book or for your writing? It, it absolutely did. You know, there are times when women of a certain age, you know, 50, 55, 60, 65, when they read some of my poetry, they, you know, they question me like, 
how do you know about this? You're too young. And so a lot of my poetry was impacted, particularly some of the the reflections of my early days were influenced by me staying with my grandmother very young. So, yeah, and and being around her friends Mm -hmm. who were much older than my mother. So there are things that I reference in in my poetry that people of a certain age, you know, may or may not have any idea about. But what it's done for me is because I do reference some things that I've grown up not only with people my age, but older. It's made my audience for this book to be wider without me even trying to do that. Awesome. So that's good. That's really good. So here's here's what I we're we're discussing the book. Um we've read, you know, you know, the synopsis well what the book is about. But can you tell our audience what the book is about? Because I'm sure they're like, well, you know, we're hearing the 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 title, we're hearing, you know, the chit chat, but what exactly is the basis of the book? What is it about? <laughs> I was trying to say this is this is the the light is not cooperating. Let's see. There we go. There we go. That's Blackberry Whispers. So uh, Blackberry Whispers is my book of poetry that essentially talks about what it means to be a black woman growing up in the South, experiencing Mm -hmm. life, love, friendship, fellowship and growing spiritually, because particularly with this second edition, you know, there's a lot that happened in my life between 2004, when I published the first edition, to last year, 2018, when I published the second edition. And so a lot of that was my own spiritual growth. So that's a lot of the new poetry that's included in this new edition um, definitely references that. So that is what I would say that the book is about. And um, thank you, Sam. Sam, Sam, I don't know if you're a man or a woman. I just need you to put that in the comments. Sam wants to know <laughs> already where can you buy the the book. Sam always gets straight to the point. Like, where can I get the book? <laughs> Blackberrywhispers.com. See, that's so easy. Very and then, easy. Uh, one of the queens or one of you guys go ahead and type it in the comments and stuff. Sam must be an avid, avid reader. Mm-hmm. And he you know. is a man based on his Facebook profile. Okay. <laughs> you know LaVon's going to do the research. <laughs> <laughs> so as you we wrote... Like Sam here. Um, I know we do like Sam. Sam supports <laughs> supports the show. Yes, Sam will does. like, love, share, and comment. So, Queen Angela, now being that you've written a book and written poetry, what do you find is the, is the hardest? Writing a book or writing poetry? Hmm. You mean just when you say writing a book or writing poetry, do you mean writing a book that is not poetry or do you mean actually the process of putting a book together as opposed to writing the individual poems? Mm -mm. Right. Definitely the writing of like I could write a write a book, whether it's a how to fictional, nonfiction, whatever, I could go in because you get time to expand your thoughts. Whereas with poetry, you know, you gotta kind of boom, boom, bam, done. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yes. Um there I think there was a time for me when I had to quote unquote uh be hit by the spirit, have the inspiration to write a poem. Maybe it's an experience. Maybe I recall something, but lately some of my poetry has been more by assignment. And so that has been challenging at times. I'll give you an example. Uh, You mentioned the poem Born to Shine that I did at the Women in Entertainment Media Awards. I messed around with that poem, if you all can believe it, for over a year. I would write a little bit and I would put it aside and I would write a little bit and I would put it aside and I just couldn't quite get it to where I wanted it to be. And so I had a friend who was having a birthday party for his dad and he had invited me and I just decided the night before you're going to finish this poem and you're going to do it at the birthday party. And so that's what I did. I, I, I just had to give myself a deadline. I wrote it, finished it, you know, deleted some stuff, figured it out, shared it there, and literally got an invitation to share that at a women's empowerment event while I was at the birthday party. And this was just reading it. I didn't know it. 
and you know, my friend, I love him to death. He is such a marketer. Once I went to him and said, Hey, you think I could share this poem? I'm trying to figure out, you know, get a rhythm for it. I've, you know, just finished it. He's like, Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. So immediately he starts walking around the room, around the house, telling his family, yo, I got this poet, you know, I brought her in for my dad's birthday party. She's bad. You know, she's an actress. And I was like, this dude is selling me and all I'm going to do is get up and read this poem off of a piece of paper because I'm just kind of working it out. But based off the reaction I received that day, I was like, okay, it's done. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, Alicia, yes, poetry can definitely be a lot more difficult, especially when I'm not on a strict deadline. Mm. Interesting. I could, I could imagine only because the way my thoughts work, and anybody that has had a conversation with me can understand this. Shannon, I can see your face. I don't know if you <laughs> recognize that or not. Um, but I have, my brain is like that. Like I have long range, like I'm a writer, no doubt. Like I'm, and when I say that, like just the way my thoughts and my imagination work, I mean, even when I talk, I it's hard for me to go boom, boom, disappoint. You know, I don't need no amens, okay? So um, one of the things I wanted to share for the people that may have missed the interview last year, and then, you know, of course, we're going to get back to the book, but I definitely want you to share your 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 Fab Five, your five that we talked about um, last year at ABTF. And if um, so I, I was... What, what, yeah, what that is, and then go ahead. So um, I actually got this from a T-Mobile commercial uh, that was one of the campaigns that was going on probably about 10 years ago. And uh, it was Charles Barkley and Dwayne Wade. And Dwayne Wade was trying to get Charles Barkley to be a part of his five. Now, cell phone plans and cell phones have changed so much in the last 10 years. But 10 years ago, you could put five people in your favorites and you could call those five individuals unlimited. You know, now mm-hmm. it's like, what, what is that about? Like, you don't have that. I mean, you know, I'm sure we all remember when you, someone would call you at seven o'clock. You'd be like, uh, let me call you back after nine o'clock when my free minutes kick in. That, that's kind of <laughs> yeah. what, what the, the fab five was. Instead of you having to wait till nine o'clock or the weekend, you could call these five people at any time um, unlimited. And so I talked about the fact that because of who Charles Barkley was, you know, he was an outstanding NBA player. It made sense for Dwayne Wade, who at that time was still in the prime of his career. I think tonight is interesting. We're talking about this tonight. He's playing his last home game in Miami, but that was very early in his career. So it made sense to want to have someone in your five, like a Charles Barkley, who was a hall of fame player. And so I, I related that for my high school and college students that I speak to by telling them that you want to make sure that you have five people in your inner circle who are important, who have your back, who can speak to you, who can lift you up, but who can also correct you in a loving way. And so thinking about who those five people are in your inner circle that can help take you from point A, which is where you are now, to point B, where you want to be in the future. Mm. Love it. Has your five uh, changed? like let's say within the last five years absolutely it has it it has and you know sometimes that makes me sad a little bit Uh, but I've often heard it you know I've read it and and I've heard it you know being said that everyone can't go with you on the journey and Mm -hmm. sometimes that's heartbreaking when you have spent you know 10 or 15 years in relationship with people and they just can't go for whatever mm-hmm. reason. So definitely, uh, my, my five has definitely changed. Um, like I said, it, it is sad at times, but I have to recognize that it's not necessarily anything, you know, maybe that she did wrong, he did wrong or whatever. It's just where I am and being in a, a strong enough place to let that person go with love. Mm. I love that. Queen Levon. That is real good. Oh my god! And I, I guess I never thought about that, but now in my mind, I'm trying to think of my five. Like, what would my five be? Because that's an awesome way to think about it, um, Angela. So I would like to ask, with the way social me- social media has really taken off, 
Um, what advice would you give to a young poet that's, you know, maybe on watching tonight thinking, oh, well, I'm just writing, you know, I'm just writing my thoughts. I'm writing what I feel, you know, no one is really would want to hear this or is this marketable or is this something that I really, you know, can, can do? What would you, advice would you give that young person, that future poet? Get on Facebook, pull out your cell phone, your iPhone, your Samsung, your flip phone, <laughs> however you can record and just share. People still have, my dad has a flip phone, so people still have flip phones, but yeah, right. share your work. You know, uh, I have a 20 year old niece and one of her friends has started sharing her poetry on Facebook, you know, and it's, it is, it's, it's, I won't say it's viral. It's like a mini viral. She's been getting great feedback and I think the feedback has been encouraging for her to continue. So um, it it can be a little nerve wracking, I admit, you know, to kind of just put yourself out there. Again, I, I didn't know how I was going to put myself out there at this birthday party. You know, I have a piece of paper and I'm up reading and, you know, not knowing how it's going to work. But that is the thing, you know, in this era of social media, like you just said, the playing field has been leveled. Yeah. You know, you can put something out there and tomorrow literally it's it can happen that fast your life can be changed i don't remember the young lady uh who did this but there was someone who did a rap uh maybe about a year ago probably sometime in late 2018 it was in response to something that was really heavy in the media and it went so viral that people like ice t ice cube all these huge names started reaching out to her on social media to commend her on her ability to rap like all mm. in one day so it it you know you gotta share it you gotta share it i want to give a quick shout out to marcus keith another uh abtf friend will be seeing them this year and i just want to add this before i go on to queen shannon's question um, I got bars and had somebody recorded the video right <laughs> last year at the movie experience. The whole world, I could have had a um, what you call it? Somebody late. A demo. Yeah. You could have had a, a deal. You could have had a I'm deal. Just by saying, now. I could have had my ducats. I'm not going to say who didn't record it right. I'm not going to put that on none of the queens. I'm just saying I dropped a hot 16, 12. I don't know how many bars it was. Okay. So, um, Jesus, help us all. With that being said, Queen Shannon. <laughs> um, I, I just want to ask a question in, as in reference to the acting. Um, okay. We've talked about, you know, the young people the poetry and getting in social media, all those things. What is one thing that you would, you would recommend for someone seeking to, ex I want to say this. And of course it's not, no, no shade or anything towards anybody, but especially women of color getting into the acting field. What is the one thing you would tell them um, when they're, they're wanting to go in that direction? Um. Wow specifically women of color. I have to be honest, I there's a part of me that feels like that there isn't a a big difference in the advice that I would give to someone uh, a woman of color and someone who is not except that you know it is what it is. We do still have biases for for women of color and even within our own community that has definitely changed a lot. I would say, say in the it. last 10 to 15 years, I was actually watching uh, the very talented Tashina Arnold um, on a show, I believe it's called Uncensored on TV One. Mm -hmm. And to hear her talk about early in her career where she was always the best friend. You know, we saw her on Martin as uh, mm -hmm. Tisha Campbell Pam. Martin's best friend. Right. Yeah. She was Pam, but she was the best friend. She was not the lead actress. And mm -hmm. she was saying like at that point in her career, that's all she, she was always the best friend. She was, she was never the lead actress, but now we see in 2017, 2018, even before that with everyone hates Chris, uh, that is beginning to change. And so mm -hmm. she's had these roles where she is a elite actress, even, you know, someone of a darker hue. So I would say, first of all, be aware that those biases do still exist, but Hollywood, the powers that be, those who are in the decision-making 
positions, they are beginning to soften that and, and to be able to look at just the talent. Um, but I think the biggest advice would be to know that, unfortunately, it's not always about you and your abilities. And I'll give you an example. Mm. I've had an opportunity to be on the other side of the table, meaning instead of going in to try to get the role, I've been on the side of the table with producers and actors to decide who gets the role. And it's a very eye-opening experience. And so I remember casting a couple of commercials about two or three years ago and sitting in a room, knowing who was the most talented person, knowing who was the second most talented person and even the third, and those top three didn't get it because it was a combination uh -huh. of things. We uh -huh. actually were putting together, part of it was we were putting together a family. We had a, a husband, a wife, and we had children. And so we were looking at this husband but this particular wife didn't go with this husband. So then we had to decide, do we really want this husband or do we really want this wife? Because if we really want this husband, then we got to choose another wife. But if we really want this wife, then we can let this one go. So casting is definitely of an wow. art more than a science and more than just about it being the very best person. Uh, sometimes when it comes down to it, if there has to be a last minute change in casting, oftentimes a producer or a director may come to the casting director and say, give us someone you know can do the job. That person may not have even auditioned for it. I, I know for a fact that that has happened in talking to people. So I think that biggest advice is that it's not always about you. You want to train. You want to be prepared. You want to take classes. You want to make sure that you present the best package. And at that point, it's it's not really in your hands. Mm. Oh, that's awesome advice. Mm -hmm. Well, there goes, my, um, there goes my um. There goes my beginning acting career. <laughs> Y'all laughing? I'm Lord, just saying. Here she go. <laughs> I'm just saying because I'll be mad. Like I know know that I did it, know that I did, but because the man don't match my part, <laughs> you know. <laughs> or you could be my, too short or you could be too tall I right. mean we have those dynamics wow. as well That's I mean really I, I don't know if you all remember the show it's it's now in reruns Facts of Life yes. yeah. with uh, Kim Fields Nancy McKeon uh, mm -hmm. when Kim Fields was first cast in that role they liked her so much they decided to keep her but she was way shorter than the other actresses so mm -hmm. they actually wrote into the script that Tootie loved roller skates and it happened to work out that she could roller skate. So uh, I don't know if you all remember in those first couple of seasons, Kim mm -hmm. Hills was always on roller skates. That's yeah. why they wrote it into the script because she was so much shorter than everyone else. Oh, wow. Wow. That's wow. what I have to say. Somebody gonna just don't write me on roller skates because Lord, the show will be over before it got started. <laughs> um, one one of the things, Queen Angela, one of the things we talked about, or one of the things that you put in your pre-show interview. Yes, guys, I do do like a pre-show situation. Okay, this don't just flow like this. It don't just flow like this all the time. Um, one of the things you said was about people turning the mirror around on themselves. So if you could explain what that means. What that means is recognizing that even though we as individuals may be called to inspire, we may be called to teach, to act, to produce, we may be called to connect individuals, recognizing that at times the things that we are called to do oftentimes are because we may need some work on those areas in our own lives. And so being willing to not just give advice, but literally take the advice that you give and then meditate on it for yourself. Because I know like for me, this acting is it's a journey. Um, I think uh, that you all shared on the Define You Instagram account, one of my raise and motivation, which is celebrate on the drive to the end zone yeah. because a touchdown only really lasts a few seconds. Well, that's how it is in acting. You know, the actual touchdown in acting may be the booking. It may be shooting the project or it may be the project actually airing. Let's just say it's the project actually airing. But there's so much to celebrate leading up to a project airing. Number one, getting the audition. Number two, getting the callback. Number three, booking the job. Number four, actually shooting the job. Number five, meeting new people while you're on that job. 
All of those things are things to celebrate long before anybody in the world sees the final product. And so that's something that I have to remind myself of specifically with acting because they're so the touchdowns sometimes are few and far between, but there's so many things to celebrate in the career outside of just something getting on the air. I love that. Yes. I love that. Cause I know I don't take my own advice and we just going to move on to, at least I'm honest about it. It's hard to take, you know, and I realize I give Queen Shannon, I can't see your face. I just need to remind you of that. <laughs> but it's, you know, sometimes stuff I tell people, I'm like, oh, that's good. I should do that. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> Cause you, the best advice you give is often the others or, you know, mm-hmm. right. So, absolutely. Queen. I think that's one of the blessings of having a book though, especially yeah. for me, because there are times when I have been sharing something and it'll just convict me in my spirit. Like, hold up, wait a minute. Are you doing this? And if you did it, mm-hmm. how would X, Y, and Z be better? And so, mm. yeah, that that's what's been helpful for me with the book that, you know, as I share it, it oftentimes it comes right back to me and I'm okay with that. I mean, when I say I'm okay with that, sometimes people believe that, you know, in order for you to give advice, to teach, to be on a platform, to be in a position where you impact individuals that you have to have it all together or your life is perfect. It's far from it. But I think the beauty is being able to recognize again, when you can turn that mirror around to yourself so that you continue to grow and get better. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm yet growing queen. Um, LaVon, you have a question. I did have a question. I wanted to ask Angela, how do you deal with um, the feedback or when you get feedback from people that think poetry is nothing more than words rhyming. Mm. You know what? I, I must be <laughs> honest. No one has ever said that to me. Really? I have never, never, like I have never received feedback that has made me feel like the art was anything less than ever. Wow. Now, there may be people, I don't even know if anyone has told me to my face um, <laughs> that they they didn't like a poem, you know. You know, sometimes people may say they didn't understand it or, mm-hmm. you know, they may ask questions like, well, what prompted you to write that? Or I can't believe you shared that or whatever. But um, no, no one has ever shared that with me that, you know, you just, you just, you know, got the rhyme dictionary out. That's all you did. It wasn't anything great so I've been fortunate I don't know what I would say to somebody I might start rhyming right back on them and you know <laughs> have them sat down as my dear drop, some, drop some, some bars or something <laughs> <It's> lord <laughs> <laughs> ain't no telling what's going on next time we come to Atlanta lord, I'm gonna start working you, know on, you know I'm gonna start working on my bars that revolution <laughs> will not be televised um, Queen Shannon <laughs> Um, so Blackberry Whisper, okay, um, and I know you said this is the second edition, um, is the first edition still even available, or, because I'm one of those people like, just forgive me, I'm nosy, I guess, so to speak, I want to know, well, what's different from the first to the second, like, you know, right. what did she add, what, what did she take away, so is the first one even still available um, out there anywhere? Except, well, you know what? I take that back. One of the things that prompted me to come out with a second edition is that I found out that someone was selling, I don't know, maybe they bought it. Maybe they found it at a yard sale or Goodwill. I have no idea. Someone was selling the first edition of my book on Amazon for like $75. And I was like, wait, what? (laughs) Someone was trying to sell one copy of Black Bear Whispers for like $75. It was something ridiculous. And they even said it had you know, beverage stains in it. And I was like, okay, do you think I'm famous and it's the last copy ever that's going to come? And so somebody's going to be willing, because it was, it's a $15 book. I, it just, I could not believe someone was doing that. And so that's kind of what prompted me to come out with the second edition. So one of the things that is different, aside from having some some new poetry added. Some of the uh, poetry that was in there has been taken out. And then some of the poetry that's inside has been updated just a little bit. I mean, cause it was, 
it's it's interesting again thinking about the title black berry whispers in 2003 mm -hmm. when i first started writing and publishing in 2004 you know there for me there was no blackberry phone on my mm -hmm. radar so that didn't even come into play but even mm -hmm. the content of some of the poetry was very dated um I don't think I was talking about pagers or anything, but yeah, it was definitely dated. So I updated some of those poems. So in two parts of that, you said some of them were taken, some of the poems were taken out. How was that process of deciding what you were going to leave, what you were going to take out? And the ones you took out, were they, I mean, how did you feel about taking those out? Like, was there, a, um, you know, they, were they not relevant or you felt that they didn't fit any long? Like, what, what was your process? Some of it had to do with who I am, like who I've grown to be. And I was like, mm, this is not the best representation of who I am in 2018. So that was part of it. Uh, some of it also was, unfortunately, we are in a very extremely uh, sensitive time where it comes to being politically mm -hmm. correct. True. And so while poetry is one of those art forms where I feel like we have a little bit more flexibility with having creative license there were some that I took out because I was like, I don't even feel like dealing with the nonsense. Mm -hmm. So let's just go ahead and not, not put this out there for 2018. Okay. And, and then you, I think about too, with you being a, a public personality, you know, if somebody may read something and, you know, maybe you'll lose a part because, right. you know, if it was something controversial or something right. of that nature, I could, you know, I always say when I when I write the greatest story ever told, I'll use I'm gonna have to use a pen name. Um <laughs> that's just my my thoughts with some of the things that I honestly could write about and will write about. So I wanted to ask you real quick, because we kinda hit back between the, the author side of you and of course the actress side of you. So how did you get started acting? Because I don't know that you that you touched on on that part. Okay, so I got started acting somewhat from my involvement in church. I started doing Easter and Christmas speeches in church. And at a very young age, say about nine or 10, my speeches were longer than the teenagers you know, the 14 and 15 year olds who were doing Easter speeches, you know, my speeches were longer. And so that was somewhat of a love of performance started being nurtured there. And then when I was in school, I was in an organization called Forensics. I don't know if you all are familiar with it. it has nothing to do with forensic science and, and you know, CSI, mm -hmm. totally different. <laughs> but it was a, I would say a performance club where we had individuals who competed in humorous performances, dramatic performances, original oratory, meaning they wrote their own speeches, kind of like public speaking. And then the last one was extemporaneous speaking, which is you come in and you don't know what your topic is going to be. You get a topic that is relevant to the time period and you have to come up with a speech in like a 15 to 20 minute time and then compete in that level. So doing both of those is kind of what started me in acting and then uh, eventually doing plays in college and studying performance. So you just found that you, that you loved it and want to go on and decided that Atlanta was the place to be. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's kind of how it went. Um, again, you know, I was studying performance in college and I was very fortunate that one of my professors brought an agent. His, my professor's wife was an actress. And so he brought her agent in to speak with us. And, you know, me trusting who my professor was because, you know, the entertainment industry for all of the greatness that it is, there are so many people who prey on people's hopes and desires to be yeah. a star. And so there's so many predators out there. And so when my professor brought this agent in, I knew this is a legitimate agent. This is someone that I could, you know, sign with. So that was also helpful in bridging the gap from college to the professional world. But yeah, that's, I, I guess that's it. You know, I was doing plays in college and I had started to doing what's called corporate training videos. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever, like maybe you have a job where you're looking at someone who... I'm going to just use for an example, I'm going to say McDonald's. Let's just say you're working mm -hmm. at McDonald's. And so 
to get started working, you have to watch a series of videos and you see the person telling you how to drop the fries and, and how do you prepare a Big Mac with two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, and blah, blah, blah. And they have on a, you know, I've been watching those commercials too long. And so they have on the McDonald's uniform, nine times out of 10, that is not a McDonald's employee. That is an actor who is doing what is called a corporate training video. So I did a lot of those starting out before I transitioned into film and television. As a matter of fact, there were some things that I was doing that people were confused about what my career was. There was a rumor that I had left one of my jobs because I was now a nurse because I played a nurse in a commercial. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding wow. me? So, <laughs> yeah. We have a question from, uh, from the audience. Were you born in the South? I was. Fayetteville, North Carolina. Shout out to the homie J. Cole. J. Cole and I from the same hometown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know him, but we from the same hometown. Let me, let me share that <laughs> to be clear, J. Cole and I have not shared a stage yet. But yes, we are from the same I, hometown. I love that. I love that yet. Queen yes. Lamont is in the Carolinas. Yes, yes. That's how I was just oh, going to say. Right up the street from me, not too far from me. I'm from in South Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina, the upstate. Oh, okay. I-85. Yes, 85. <laughs> you see everywhere. <laughs> so what, what has writing taught you? What has writing taught me? Mm-hmm. Hmm, that is a good question. I would say one thing is to trust yourself and that there is always something to give because I think that that is what writing is about. You know, while sometimes I may write a poem or I may write something like a quote, a short story, a blog post, even though I might write it and get inspired, that is just another way for me to give back and share that. And so sometimes it is a little intimidating and a little scary to share those things. But yeah, I think writing has taught me that there's always something to give. Do you you think writing, um, do you think writing leaves you more open and exposed than acting? No, (laughs) no, no. Because there is something, you know, I I don't think I, writing is definitely impactful, definitely. But there, I did not realize how impactful acting was and how much acting can even be a ministry until I was in a room with uh, a minister, a pastor. We were, I think it was on, we weren't necessarily watching it, but Why Did I Get Married? Tyler Perry's Why Did I Get Married was on. And it was the scene with uh, Malik Yoba and Janet Jackson, where they were kind of like finally confronting each other about the loss of their child. Yeah. And so this pastor was saying, you know, when she and her husband watched that movie, that opened up the opportunity for them to talk about the loss of their child. And I was like, whoa. Like she was saying they both had been feeling the same way about the loss of their child, but had never discussed it. And so watching that movie gave them that permission. And so to think about it in that way, I know how it will open, you know, you open yourself up because while that was a good thing on the flip side, depending on the role that you play, sometimes people can't separate the reality from the, the, the performance, you know, I, I didn't realize that this was a big deal, but I played a, I guess you could say a villain on Tyler Perry's love thy neighbor. It never occurred to me that that was like a bad thing. Like literally to me, it was a comedy. I did it. It was fun. And so I remember when the episode ended, the first thing my mom called me and she was like, well, baby, you didn't tell me you was playing a crook. (laughs) And in my mind, I was thinking, okay that doesn't mean you know I'm just thinking okay whatever but lo and behold as time passed and I'm out in the public there were a couple people who rolled up on me like yo why you do my girl like that and I was like oh this is like really serious and all my character did was steal some money I can you imagine some of these actors who portray you know roles where they're killing people or they're doing all this stuff i mean i've heard of soap opera actors you know being slapped in the airport because a fan can't separate fiction from 
reality. So I would say the acting definitely opens you up more. Mm. Wow. If you are a power follower, I I did see where they said the same thing. You know, they have the son that plays on Power Tyreek. And yes. a lot of parents was feeling like, you know, he just needs a good, you know, yes. guy, you know, and that when he got on the elevator with someone, they actually did that, you know, it was like, you need your butt. Well, you talking to your mama like this. <laughs> so it is, but you are so true that people, it is hard sometimes to disconnect that person that they're, that's a role for them. You know, that's their job. They're just, this is true. It's not them. And so it is hard. It can be very hard um, to disconnect that person from the role that they're playing, that person that they're portraying at that time. So, oh, wow. yes. C- confession, confession. <laughs> I was I was like that about Danny Glover for the longest time after Color Purple. Really? Then, I was. I was like, why would he like I was just done with him. You Lawrence Fishburne, him. too. Lawrence Fishburne and what's love got to do with it? Him too. And then they both redeemed themselves when I watched Lethal Weapon and he like, I just loved him in Lethal Weapon. Yeah, um, and then when I saw Lawrence Fishburne in um, The Matrix, I was like, oh, okay. Okay. They redeemed themselves. I'm good now. We, we good with them. We're good with them. So <laughs> guilty. But I guess, Angela, that's a, that would be like a, a testament to your acting skills absolutely take you like if people can't separate you from the role that mm-hmm. means that you're a very good actor oh yes yeah yes and i did yeah. watch yeah. You know, some some snippets of, of stuff to prep for last year so i was like oh okay and then honestly i was like i wonder if she liked that in person <laughs> you know i <I'm> not <laughs> Cause I was like, I might have to pull sassy, sassy Valencia out the closet. You know? <laughs> ready for it, just ready. Yeah. Cause I was like, mm, she seemed kind of sassy. All just based on you know clips and stuff I saw. Mm-hmm. But like I said, that's a testament to who you are as, as an actress, as as an author, and as a speaker. And I could see um, see how all of them is like a gumbo of things that just add to each other. Right. So absolutely. Uh, how I want to ask you one question and then we'll, you know, definitely want to drop how the audience can get the book and connect with you. So through all of this, through all of, mm-hmm. of everything, the experience of, of writing and acting and really putting yourself out there, what kept you motivated along the way? Because I'm pretty sure it was times you was like, you know what? Peace deuces Atlanta. You know, or maybe that's just me because the traffic is disgusting. I, I just. Hey, man. <laughs> um, what's kept me motivated? Definitely my parents, because I remember uh, this was before I even moved to Atlanta about 10 years ago. There was another actress who she and I went out for a lot of the same roles. And, you know, we had been kind of like, I guess you could say competitors ever since we were in college. And so this is like five, six years after college. There were things that I was trying to do that door and she would come right behind me Mm. and it would be open for her. And so I I remember I was um, at my parents' house one day. And I was, you know, I was just like, maybe I just don't even need to be doing this. Oh, my mama nipped that in the bud real quick, like really quick. She pulled out black mama with this, with the cape real quick um, and nipped that in the bud. So, <laughs> and I think that, you know, coupled with that, the fact that at one time my parents were telling me, go to college, you can do the acting, but have something to fall back on. And I made the decision not to do that, not to have a, you know, get a degree in something that I can fall back on. And so I think because they saw my commitment, they became even more committed to supporting me. And so that that's the thing that keeps me motivated. And then I'm gonna be honest, is I also fall back to my five. So hmm. I, I keep the right people in my five that help keep me motivated. Um, you know, we're not all into the performing arts. We, we do different things, but yeah, knowing, you know, being able to talk to someone and, you know, have someone say, okay, you know what, if I were you, I wouldn't do this. Or, you know, you can do this role. I know you can. Or, you know, I, I think about one of, um, one of my, my guy friends who 
he coached me into my audition for Love Thy Neighbor. And I booked because he knew me well enough to be able to get me where I needed to be. And so I think those are the things that keep me motivated. My parents and my top five. I'm going to get down to my five. I'm going to start start unfriending people. (laughs) Queen LaVon, Queen Shannon, hopefully y'all make the cut. I'll let y'all know by the end of the week. I know where you Um, live. (laughs) (laughs) Queen Queen (laughs) LaVon, I'm not even even starting with y'all. Y'all, we are on doing, you know, the Find You Radio Facebook Live edition and y'all passing threats. I'm just saying, when I get down to my five, I don't know who's going to make it. You only got three to choose. I know. Queen Queen LaVon, would you (laughs) like to go ahead and ask one last question of Queen Angela? I I would like to know what's next. Yeah. Mm, What's What's next? Wow. What is next? Well, uh, Valencia mentioned this. She she added the title director. So I directed my first short film last year. It is still Yay. in post-production. So we switched some things up on our editorial team. But I definitely want to do some more directing. So I'm looking for opportunities um, in that vein. I actually had been directing in theater for a while, but I took a a very um, conscious and deliberate break from theater. It's extremely time consuming. And so I was focused on film and television, focused on film and television acting and just decided it was time to step behind the camera. Because while there are so many decisions that goes into deciding who can be in front of the camera, being behind the camera, it, it's not nearly as uh, as complicated. Mm. So th- that is one of the things that is next. Mm. And the the title of that film, if you wanted to to drop that as well, so we could still so we could look out for it. It is called Summer of Seven. It is a somewhat like the uh, the writer kind of describes it as a Christian faith based version of Harry Potter where you have seven young people who end up at a summer camp and they are charged with dealing with the evil forces at the summer camp and discover that they have superpowers from God. Mm. Ah, I should have been casted. I should have been casted at that in that. Um, That's what the teacher is out. Look, (laughs) you don't know my superpowers. Uh, Queen Jeanette Hill. Hey, Jeanette said she may call you. If you remember, okay. Jeanette was there from, uh, she she had she, a phenomenal play last year at ABTF that made me cry. I couldn't, and you talk about role confusion. There was people in that play, a man in particular, I told him I wasn't talking to him the rest of the festival because of what he wow. already played in, in the play. Um, wow. And Queen Denisha, thank you. She said uh, she could listen to your voice all day. I know Angela has a oh, well, thank voice. you. Like like butter, like butter. You know. So th- you know what? Let me let me go ahead and put this out here. That's the <laughs> other thing that is next is doing more with voiceover. Yeah. I was moderating. Awesome. I moderated a, um, a discussion of Michelle Obama's book Becoming, and mm-hmm. after the I moderated, there was someone who walked up to me and she said, "So is your voice insured?" Mm. And I was like, "Excuse me." She's like, do you have insurance on your voice? And I was like, no. And and I'm well aware that depending upon what your career is, you can't insure things. So like if you're a hand model, like your hands are just beautiful. If you're a hand model, you can insure your hands because that's how you make your money. And so I was like, no. But if she thought enough of my voice that she questioned whether it was insured, I realized I need to be doing more with Mm -hmm. it. So absolutely. here to the define you radio family you've heard it here okay. be on the awesome. lookout for, for for voiceover projects i've done voiceover in the past but it just has not been a focus yeah it seems with uh with audio books and a lot of people mm-hmm. turning more to more to you know audio things um like i'm reading the comments uh because denisha said if you if if she did my audiobook, I'd listen to it all the time. LOL. Okay. And Queen Jeanette, and if you don't have her information, Angela, I will connect y'all. I love Jeanette. She says, okay. um, 
the amen the circle. amen circle is casting yeah. okay yeah which is huh. um well, I'll, I'll connect i'll connect y'all after the show and i do vouch okay. for both of y'all y'all know i don't i don't just be vouching for people because somebody be like Valencia, you introduced me but i do i do vouch and y'all probably met last year and just don't remember um, but right. I'll definitely do do that. But I could see you doing voiceover because your voice is like I want to work mm-hmm. on my voice because you have like a calming voice. Like somebody could listen to it on like one of the meditation things as they go to sleep. I have a voice that you know I have a different kind of voice. And with that, Queen Shannon, Look, I don't... <laughs> you you number six on my Fab Five list almost. <laughs> We'll, we'll talk after the show. So we will funny. talk after the show. Um, no, but actually, Levon asked the question I was going to ask what was next. Um, but I guess I will go to how do how do the people stay in touch with you? How do they connect with you? How do they follow you? I am on Facebook, Twitter, as well as Instagram at the Angela Ray. That is T H E Angela Ray, and Ray is R A Y. So I'm active on all three of those platforms. Awesome, but awesome. She, but she is a celebrity, so don't y'all come to her inbox acting common. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you don't, we don't want people getting too comfortable when we have celebrity <laughs> guests on. We got to act like we know how to act. And this is how we know how to act right here, right? I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know, <laughs> don't even know what to say. Uh, Queen Angela, with the with the see Blackberry could have like it could describe your voice. Mm. Mm. Like Blackberry voice. whispers mm. that and that whisper and molasses because you know molasses were a smooth bit. Mm. Yes. Now I'm Definitely. not gonna get that song out my head. I know, and I ain't lying. Ever since I saw <laughs> the name of the book, that's why I was thinking Blackberry molasses. Yes, because that song was like very calm, and you have a very calm. It was so I was like, okay, um, I don't know. Marcus Keith put something about what about autographs that he could sell. I don't know what he's talking about, but real quick, the did they sell any copies of the book for seventy five dollars? I have no idea. I doubt it. I mean, who's going to buy a book that has it as waters? They literally said it. They didn't, they weren't even hiding. They said it has water stains in it. And I was like, so if they did, I mean, I doubt it. I doubt it. But it, that was one of the things that let me know that I needed to either put the original back in print or do another edition. And I just decided to do another edition. Hmm. I don't know how I would feel like if somebody was selling one of my books, like I'd be flattered and then at the same time I'd you know that other yeah, side of yeah. come out that don't that run me my money side mm-hmm. of it would come out. I'm just saying. Um but well, I, you know what I will challenge you, Valencia, to to Google yourself and look that up because that's how I stumbled on it. Is I I, I go every now and then I kind of Google myself just to see what's out there, make sure it's nothing crazy. See if and that's how I found me. out. Right. Whatever. Exactly. And so that's how I found that out. You know, every now and then, you know, I will find out something that I didn't know someone put out. And, you know, I've been very fortunate. It hasn't been anything crazy. Um, You know, someone maybe will pick something up off my Instagram and then it'll get into a newsletter or it'll end up in a press release. And I'm like, well, how did they get that? I didn't submit that. My publicist didn't. And so it, you know, sometimes things will kind of spiral like that. But that's how I found out. So uh, I have another friend who said that she found out her book was being sold on walmart.com and she can't figure out how that's happening because she's like, I'm not getting that money. So right. Hmm. now, you know, because this is a, you know, this is America. Anybody could, you know, buy your book and resell it. I mean, it's what we do. We buy something we don't like, you know, we sell it on Poshmark. We sell it on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's possible, but no one should be, making copies of your work right and selling yeah. it. And that that's right. the difference so um she wasn't able to determine yet you know how whoever this was selling her book on walmart.com was actually doing it probably walmart itself but let me not say that before all my internet just shut down 
I'm just See, saying. How about that? Look. All right, you go. <laughs> okay. Look, a little that thing come across so the good. screen or somebody come running. I'm just saying. Look, I, okay. Those views are that do not express. How, well, how does it go? These are not the views of, of Defy You Expressed. How does that go? <laughs> the disclaimer. The yes. following is a- down How did, and does not reflect the view of Define You Radio and its sponsors. There Something you go. Like that. We all know that. Look, we've heard I it have several to times. You record that for me. I was, no. Yes, That's I was just going to say that. Like, I'm going to get you just to record it for me, and that way I can play that disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> right. At the for, beginning of the for show. Every show. So mm-hmm. that way, just in case, I don't know if, you know, how Queen Shannon and Queen LaVon may act if they not in my five. So that way, right. whatever they may say <laughs> afterwards, we've already <laughs> warned that Define You Radio is a whole other entity outside <laughs> of the Queen You see. Right. So, Queen mm-hmm. Angela, it has been a pleasure. Yes. Uh, Thank you, guys you all her. so much. For- you are. We got to have you back, especially because I want you to record some stuff. Like, you can record the intro. Welcome to Define You Radio or something. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying. Okay. LeVar, I would be delighted. LeVar paying for it. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Y'all make sure y'all pick up Blackberry Whispers at blackberrywhispers.com. It's real simple. The We'll drop it again in the link. Connect with Queen Angela Ray. She is on Facebook, Instagram. Um, like I said, don't y'all act extra common and familiar with our celebrity guests okay i'm just saying um with that being said pens and paper down i hope you guys have definitely been inspired by just people doing stuff queens out there doing stuff queen angela is such a humble person we've had the pleasure of meeting her and she's out there doing doing her thing and still showing up to inspire others like me like i'm gonna work on my voice and my bars that being said class is officially over make sure you, you need me got that beatbox for you valencia oh, I should uh, that beatbox uh, right now girl you know what i'm saying wait, 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 i'm saying wait. look this is the <laughs> wait, what? okay class is not over. Get her started. After go ahead what you got oh, not get her are you ready for the beatbox I'm ready can't oh, do okay. it <laughs> This is the Find You Radio. Uh, we are signing off. Uh, okay. With that being said, <laughs> is, <laughs> class is is officially over. <laughs> way, Shannon, look, you got the voice. You were supposed to come in with some notes. We could have had a whole. This, this it was supposed to be a hug there. It was supposed to be a hug. I'm just saying. Okay, let's do it again. I got you. I got you. Define you. See, I got you. You got to match okay. her beatbox. And I, oh, uh-uh. Uh, I got her beatbox. I got okay. her beat my head. Okay, go ahead, LaVon. LaVon, like, look, I ain't signed up. I this. stay in my lane <laughs> and drink my pretty waters. <laughs> Y'all, it has been a, a great show. Y'all know where to find us <laughs> next week. Same time, same place. Until then, your past doesn't define you. It gives you definition. And what you do with that is up Thank you for listening. Connect with the show at the Define You Facebook. Until next time, remember your past doesn't define you. It gives you definition, and what you do with that is up to you.